this slot is to well illustrate how OSM works in practice. So we will first uh, well uh, um, provide some some of the reasonings behind the, the new architecture that Vanessa has explained. Okay, and then uh, we will illustrate the well the life cycle, the whole life cycle of uh, network service. Okay, from the design to the instantiation and, and service operation. Okay. okay. Well, so this was the, the release three architecture uh, that was functional, but it had some uh, inconveniences, okay, that we are illustrating here. So first one is that the um, the normal interface of the system was tightly coupled to the service orch orchestration, the SO component here in the figure. That means that almost or any interaction that uh, happened in the system need, needed to go through that service orchestrator, that making, uh, let's say, the development of uh, new features very complex because any new feature had to, let's say, go through that service orchestrator to be implemented. So, in addition, we discovered that the, the modularity of the architecture was uh, not appropriate for incorporating uh, new modules because of this uh, rigid uh, architecture, okay? So, we took, I think, three main uh, architectural decisions. One of them is just to keep the uh, communication to the lower levels, the VIN controllers and the VNFs, in the same way that it was happening before. So the RO, the resource orchestrator, that was the component uh, in charge of deploying virtual machines and networks into the beams, it was still going, still going to do the same. And the VCA that was in charge of uh, uh, hosting the logic for configuring the VNFs, that's what the charm is, okay, I will explain later. Uh, we will uh, keep it so that it will still configure the VNFs in the same way. The second uh, decision, I think it's critical here, is uh, as I have mentioned, since the SO was the component where every interaction in the system was happening, we decided to split it, okay? So that instead of making all the calls go through the SO, we split it into two different modules, the MBI and the LCM. The MBI is the one offering the northbound interface of the system, okay? And it's mainly oriented to offer a REST API, okay, for, for consumption while the LCM is going to deal with any action related to the life cycle of a network service. It could happen, for instance, that some of the operations could go from the MBI directly to other models or through the MBI to the LCM, depending on the operation. That makes, let's say, the, the architecture more, more appropriate to, to scale and to be able to operate in different conditions and for different API calls. And finally, we decided to include uh, Three here, three main uh, blocks here: the Kafka bus, a common database uh, based on NoSQL, like Mongo, okay, in this case, and an object storage system. And the idea was that the MBI could uh, talk directly to these different components in order to, let's say, do the depending on the API call. But not only the MBI, but any other module could also interface with those uh, Kafka bus, common database, and object storage, so that. In that way, we are facilitating the communication from the MBI to any other module through these uh, three mechanisms. And as a result, this is the architecture that Vanessa has presented. I, I won't go into many details, okay? This is the summary, okay, that Vanessa has commented. One, one thing that is important is that we are uh, uh, not only keeping the plugin model that we had at that moment, that, but we are also extending that plugin model. So here is a picture of the plugin model that we have. You see here different components, the RO. The RO is the resource orchestrator, as I have told you, and it's the responsible of deploying VMs, PMs, sorry, and, and deploying networks. So for deploying the VMs and networks, typically it can rely on different plugins for VMs, like the OpenVM plugin, OpenStack plugin, VMware plugin, and AWS plugin. But it also has some plugins for SDN controllers for creating the underlay connectivity uh, between VMs, okay? Uh, this is, we have, we are supporting right now ODL plugin, Anonos plugin, and a Floodlight plugin. And we are right now working on the plugins for the WIM, 
particularly in a TAPI plugin and an ODL based uh, plugin that is, well, very simple, but it uh, serves for the purpose of, of testing the, the wind management from, from the arrow. Then, uh, from the MOM perspective, it's also in charge of, of contacting the, the uh, beams for uh, getting metrics, and that's why the OST plugin and VMware plugin and AWS plugin are there for getting the metrics from the beams. But also, there will be a, a plugin for getting metrics from the VNFs that will interact directly with you. Okay? I, I, well, I don't know if Jan Pedro will get more details on that, but it's something that is also in development right now. The things under development are marked with these dot li dotted lines here. So, in addition, for the message bus, we are using Kafka, but we also have a plugin for a file system based message uh, bus. For the common database, exactly the same. We have a file system plugin and a MongoDB plugin. So here the idea is that we could replace at any moment in time the backend uh, by the one that we choose okay, want to, if we want to change. Okay? And for object storage, right now we are using a file system based plugin, but we could move to Ceph or Swift or any other storage that we might think of. Okay? Finally, uh, for the Norban interface role based access control, we are right now implementing a plugin that is uh, based on Keystone OK for us as a backend for authentication and, and authorization. One of the, the good points of this new architecture is that all the components uh, of, of OSM right now are deployed uh, with Docker. Uh, that means that uh, we, are, we have a stack that is called the OSM stack that contains all the, these containers that are shown here, the MBI, Kafka, Mon, etc. Okay, so we are moving to a microservice architecture that is possible also to define a better, let's say, a scale policies too. Okay, so uh, that's also convenient. In addition, we still have the LexD. LexD is here used for running Lexi containers, okay? And the main purpose of this is to run the UU controller and all the charm logic, okay? But the, the good point of this architecture is that this architecture has a network that is the network, uh, NetOSM Docker network. And to that network, we can connect any other stacks, any other Docker stacks that you might th we might think of. So in this release four, we are, for instance, uh, showcasing how to add an ELK stack, okay, for, for management, and also an, a combination of Prometheus and Grafana. Prometheus is a time series database, okay, and Grafana is a um, tool to, to show, let's say, uh, metrics, okay, or any other kind of monitoring parameters, okay, and we are combining them also in a per performance monitoring stack, okay. But the good point is that you could add and you could create your own stack, okay, and connect to OSM very easily, okay, and make take advantage of anything that is published to the Kafka bus, et cetera, okay? So now I will go into, let's say, the, the practice view of OSM. So this is the picture that Javier has illustrated, okay, showing how from a VNF package and network service package where we have the, let's say, resource description and topology and also the management procedures, we can drive uh, the deployment and uh, day one, day two configuration of, of the network service. But I, I think that it's worth to illustrate the different phases that happen uh, uh, from, for uh, the lifecycle management of, of a network service. So we start first with the design. Okay, the design is mainly something that an operator has to do. Okay, the BNF package normally is designed by a BNF vendor, but the network service is normally designed by an operator. Then it's expected that we onboard the VNFs and network service packages into the system. Then we typically instantiate it, and by instantiation here we mean that we, not, we do not only deploy the, the network service, but also we indicate in which data centers we want to deploy every VNF, and we also uh, configure initially those VNFs to interact each other. Okay. Then we move to the NS lifecycle management here, and what we want to illustrate here is any kind of operation related to scaling, upgrading my or updating my network service, etc., that could happen once the network service is up and running. And finally, also the service operation, that means running some specific actions on some BNFs, okay, to, to do a day two operation. So this is how it works, uh, more or less, okay, the design. This is well, for understanding better how OSM works and, and the whole process, you, you might have to come to one of those hackfests that 
uh, Francisco Javier and Vanessa have told, but uh, here you could see more or less an example. So as part of the design, you create a schema of, of your VNF internals, the, the external connection points that will be offered by your VNF, the VDUs or, or VMs that are part of your VNF, and also the internal networks or internal virtual links that interconnect them, okay? And based on that schema, you write a descriptor that uh, contains mainly two things, okay? The, this topology and also the specific management procedures or VNF primitives that will be exposed by that VNF. In addition, we encapsulate artifacts like charms that I will explain later, okay, what's, what's a charm, uh, but it's mainly the, the configuration logic of, the, of that VNF, okay, all the programs that could be run, okay, to, to run a configuration action on a specific VNF, and also additional information like icon, readme, etc. And in a very similar way, a network service is designed the same way. You, pa you start from a schema, you write the descriptor, you also have artifacts and additional metadata. So, since the charm normally is very, uh, could be something that could be complicated to understand, I have tried to write some, something like a summary, okay, of how a charm works, okay? So, mainly a charm is a set of actions and hooks. Actions are programs and hooks are events and signals. And for commodity and reusability, those actions and hooks can be grouped together in layers. So let's imagine that I want to create a charm and I want to create, uh, first of all, I need to create a new layer, okay, and for my charm, and that new layer could inherit from other layers that could pre-exist, okay, like the red layer and the green layer, okay. Those layers, as I have mentioned, have hooks and action that take part of that layer, okay. When I, uh, in addition to that, I also need to write some code, obviously. For instance, I need to write the, the code for uh, creating the action touch. It's a very simple action that everybody could follow, follow if you know Python, okay? That is mainly connecting via SSH, okay, to the VNF and to run the command touch and the file, okay? So it's a pretty simple action, it's the, the most simple action probably, okay? And, well, you need to implement the code of the action in, in the charm itself, okay? Mainly uh, co commands or API calls, okay, to the, to the VNF. And as a result, when you build the, your, your charm, what you get is a combination of all the layers together, okay, all the actions and hooks together in a single charm logic, okay? But this is not enough. We need to, later on, map it to OSM descriptors. And for that, uh, we need to add into the descriptor some information. So, for instance, let's think of a charm that could be named AAA, okay, for, ma for a radio server, okay, and could have some actions or some primitives like get configuration from EMS, where, well, I could pass here the IP address, and probably not this value, but an IP address, not real IP address, but I could also have some primitives like my touch primitive from the previous example, or more complex primitives like adding a user to my system, okay, where I need to provide a username, for instance, okay. This is the, the way we model the different actions and primitives in, in OSM. As I have mentioned, always a primitive need, needs to be mapped to a specific action. So, now I'm going to illustrate with OSM how the uh, onboarding and instantiation works. Uh, for the onboarding, mainly, we will interact with the northbound interface of the system, either through the UI or through the client. And the main point of the onboarding is that all the crude operations are going directly from the MBI to the common database and object storage, and they are not going through the Kafka bus. So I'm going to show you, hopefully. Could you please switch to the HDMI? Let's see if it works. It switch off now. If I need the password, Celia, you need to come here to do the password. So we tried with a display port. We tried with a VGA to HDMI adapter, and in the, neither neither of the two work it, so we asked Sylvia for his, her laptop. This was not really planned. Yeah. Thank you, Sylvia. 
No. Okay. So, well, it's pretty simple. This is the OSM interface. Let's go quickly through the, uh, probably the Wi-Fi I need to reconnect. I will take the freedom of doing it. Now, okay, so here's the, the home, okay? This is the new UI from release four, okay? So you have a dashboard where you could see all the different packages for the network services, for the VNFs, okay? You have also the detail of the instances that are running network service instances uh, and VNF instances that are part of that network service. You have the VIM accounts also. So I will illustrate how to, how easy it is to onboard a VNF package and a network service package. So, for instance, let's see here. I have here a package. You see, this is the tardy set file, okay? This is the VNF package, and this is the network service package. So, onboarding is as simple as taking the package and moving it here, okay? So, we have here uh, my VNF. This VNF is a DNS uh, resolver, okay? So, I, could, uh, I will deploy it, and I will show you that it will resolve uh, uh, domain names uh, when I resolve them from my computer here. And the network service package, the same. Okay, I want to take it. Since this is not my computer, I don't know if I will be able to show you, but this is the, well, I don't know if I can show you the details of the package or not, okay? Probably not, okay. So now I have here the package, VNF package, network service package, okay, pretty simple so far. Now I'm going to instantiate. So for the instantiate, I'm going to, well, I could do it from here, new network service, but I'm going to do it from here because it's going to be much quick. Instantiate. I'm going to put here OSM workshop, description, well, OSM workshop, that's all. And I will select AWS. So from release two, I think, uh, if I remember properly, we are able to deploy it also in public clouds, okay? So I will deploy this in, in AWS, and hopefully in a few seconds we will have it, okay? Meanwhile, I will show you the, um, the details of what's happening, okay, here in the instantiation, while we expect, while we expect, we, come on, now, okay. So, uh, well, the instantiation is mainly, con it, it's a combination of three steps. First, the deployment. The deployment happens, uh, it, it's done by the arrow, okay? So what happens here is that, first of all, when we receive, the MBA receives the, the order of, of instantiating a network service, it will create a record here in the NoSQL database, okay? And we'll publish a message through the Kafka bus to anyone interested in knowing that a new network service instance is going to be instantiated. This is critical because, for instance, the LCM will take it for uh, deploying actually the network service, but other modules like the monitoring module or the policy module could also uh, be aware of that new network service instance and do whatever actions that might be required, okay? Then the LCM will consume that message and will deploy the network service by making use of the arrow, okay? Mainly the arrow will deploy the topology of the network service, the different VMs and networks that interconnect them, and will also be in charge of the day zero configuration. By day zero configuration here, we are meaning basically cloud init. And cloud init here can be used for a lot of purposes, but in the context of OSM, we are restricting the purpose of cloud init to the static information, static configuration that is uh, independent on the specific location where we are deploying the VNF and independently of the different neighbors. I mean, it's not parameterized, okay? That's the, the importance here of, of day zero configuration. And day one configuration is any information that is parameterized, and this is happening via charms, okay, through the VCA. That is mainly the UU controller that allows you to, to deploy. So let's go to the, um, well, hopefully it's here. Here. Now, it's configured and running, okay? So it's okay. Let me check here the instances. You could see here the instance. I will get the IP address. Oh, I'm not showing. Okay, sorry. Thank you, I'm Peter. Now, 
perfect. Sorry, you were not seeing that. So I will show it again. Here the instances, it says running and configure. And if I go to the VNF instances, it says that we have here this, this IP address. So I will just illustrate that the network service works. I will run here a simple command. That is resolve this domain. And it's been resolved, okay? This domain is resolved to this IP address. If I delete right now the network service, and I will do it, and I try again. This is the one. Five, four, three, two, one. I will refresh. Now. Now the new, I think that you don't have the latest, latest version. The latest version has the automatic refresh, but it doesn't matter, okay? And if I try now, it's not resolving. So it's real, okay? I'm, okay, I'm just illustrating that it's real. And finally, and I will move, uh, and I will uh, give the turn to, to Jan Pietro. We also have the service operation, okay? Service operation is very similar. I mean, it's always offered by the MBI, the MBI, will receive the, the action or the operation to be done. And the MBI will publish a message in the Kafka bus. And depending the message, on, on the message, the operation will be handled by a specific module or a different one, okay? So I, I, I hope that you have got uh, a picture of the distributed new microservice architecture that we have implemented in OSM and the way it works. But now you are going to see some interesting features on the release five preview, okay, for monitoring. The Pietro is going to show. Thank you, Gerardo. Okay, so let's continue seeing OSM in action. And this time uh, we'll see a couple of features from uh, the monitoring perspective. Uh, what, from the monitoring perspective, how we see the instantiation process after LCM, which is our orchestrator, takes the descriptors and sends the instructions to the, to the different components through the bus and the RO module takes care of instantiating the resources uh, towards the SDN controllers and, and uh, the beams. The monitoring, yeah, I will expand this a little bit, okay. Okay, so the monitoring module starts monitoring the BNF according to a descriptor. In the descriptor, we pick which metrics we want to, to measure and if we want to do it or not. And also there is a policy manager model which creates alarms uh, based on the thresholds we defined on the descriptor and also takes actions in, uh, related to the BNF based on what we defined at the descriptor level. So in the first demonstration, it's a quick demonstration, I will show you how uh, we can display metrics from the BNF. In release five, we will support gathering metrics not only from the beam, which was supported at release four, but also from the BNF directly through the VCA model. So we will be able to show metrics that are um, specific to the function. Then uh, we uh, saw a value in including a time series database inside the OSM stack. So we will have this uh, supported by a Prometheus database. And there we will store the BNF metrics uh, related to the infrastructure and related to the function itself that are relevant for, for us. And we will be able to correlate those, that information. And optionally, we can show that in Grafana or whatever tool uh, we, we want to use. So let's see that in action. Um, I have here. I need to start some things. Now let me see if this is working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, oh, there it is. Start automatically. 
okay yeah we had some limited connectivity so now it should work so we have a, a vnf already instantiated which is called dns05 we can see it here uh, from the OpenStack uh, Vim perspective, and uh, here instantiated at open source Mano. So what we are going to do is, we uh, are seeing that CPU, for example, is at zero. So let's um, let's connect to the VNF, and uh, let's elevate the CPU a little bit. I have a script there in the VNF. So we'll see in short that this uh, CPU uh, starts to go up. And the, um, the, the way it works is Mon uh, continuously monitors the telemetry system of the respective beam, so OpenStack or VMware, for example, and also the VNF metrics uh, from, from the VNF itself. And it stores this in a Prometheus database. And optionally, we can see it here, you see that we already are at 30%. And uh, what, we, what we got as well is uh, the scaling action, which is new at release 5. So what will happen is that uh, as soon as we, ha we reach a threshold, which is predefined at a descriptor at 80%, uh, this should uh, generate a, a, a notification to the policy manager, which at the same time will decide what to do. Based on the descriptor, we decide to scale one BDU, one extra BDU of our, in our BNF. So that's what is going to happen as soon as we reach 80% uh, of, of CPU. So let's wait a little bit. Um, what we also uh, will see is that every, every action that is happening at the bus or the logs that are uh, displaying at every component can be shown on logging analytics tools or stacks like ELK, which are also part of the optional OSM stacks. So now we see that CPU is at 100%, and this obviously will generate an alarm and will make this uh, BNF scale one of its BDUs. So in, a, in short, if everything goes right, we will see that, uh, that a new BDU will appear there in the network topology. Now let's keep it, let's keep this in parallel. This usually takes uh, between one or two minutes, depending on the granularity you have on your telemetry system. And in the meantime, let me show you another thing. Let's keep this here and here. And we'll bring. OK. So while it does its work, I would like to, to emphasize that everything, uh, as Francisco Javier uh, told at first, is uh, modeled in, in open source Mano so that we have a single point of control. And in the case of the scaling uh, action or, or the scaling action, let me refresh this, just in case we lost connectivity. Okay. Oh, there it is. So it needed a refresh. So we see that the escalation happened. And it scaled beautifully. Uh, and what, how we achieve this, or how will, be, will we be able to achieve this in um, release 5? We just need to define that in our descriptor. So we define the NFBI metric, or the BNF-specific metric that we want to monitor. And then we find the scaling descriptor, which contains uh, some relevant uh, parameters like what will we do when we are less than a threshold or greater than a threshold. 
and uh, how many BDUs will be scaled. So it's important to say that this happens at the BDU level. So we have a lot of granularity on uh, the components we, we uh, want to scale. Um, so obviously we can scale in, if there is time, we will see that happen. Down CPU. Uh, so while we wait for that, what we can conclude regarding monitoring, what is coming for release five is that we will be able to monitor uh, both BIM infrastructure and BNF uh, specific metrics. Uh, everything will be stored in our own TSDB in open source manner. Of course, you can export that to another uh, metric collection system you want. We'll support uh, the first section supported by the policy manager is how to scaling at the BDU level. And uh, we will provide uh, enhanced integration with external logging tools like ELK. This is, is supported since release four, but in release five, we will um, provide the dashboards, uh, uh, predefined dashboards, so that it's simpler to just raise the OSM ELK stack, and you will see a complete dashboard showing what's going on at the, at the bus, what's going on at, at every component. So uh, operationally speaking, uh, that will be uh, very, very useful. So let's see, uh, CPU is down again, and um, this uh, BNF or BDU will disappear soon, uh, like in one or two minutes. So in the meantime, maybe you have any question for us? What's the model for the VNF descriptor? Sorry? It's Tosca based or? Ah, no, it's not a uh, Tosca based. Uh, do you want to complement uh, where we are going uh, regarding the descriptor format? Well, the, the, you know that the, the difference between the language where the descriptor is written and the model that could be based. Okay, so information model, data models, etc. So here it's written in YAML, but the model is written in Yang. Okay, Jan, and it's uh, we, we started from Jan from two years and a half ago from the very beginning. Okay, and now we are aligning that work with the Sol six spec in NFV that is writing also the model for BNF and I was able the descriptors in Jan. Okay, in contrast to Sol one that is based on Tosca. Do you have any tool that to convert from Tosca to Young model? Uh, no. We don't need it. Okay, I I don't understand the purpose, but <laughs> maybe it's interesting in some cases. I I, I know that there are mm, uh, there is software that is uh, there are companies that try trying to build tools to convert from one model to another or to convert the scripts from one model to another. But <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Sorry. No. 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 <laughs> no. no. I know, I know. So I, one thing I forgot to say uh, is that uh, this is how ELK looks like. Basically, you'll see uh, logs flowing, and uh, they can be grabbed uh, like this, or we can build a specific dashboards with every parameter uh, we want. So for example, the number of escalations, or a number of BNF that were instantiated, or that were down, everything will be prepackaged in a in a dashboard uh, that will uh, be uh, ready as soon as you instantiate this stack. Any other question? Any other question? Okay, uh, one question there. This is this is possible right now. All, all this, okay, and all this that Jambito uh, has shown has been mostly done in one release and a little bit more, right? So it's possible thanks to the new architecture. So we were stuck at the moment where we could, uh, it was really difficult to add new functionality and we were adding in a few months a uh, lot of stuff yeah, thanks to the new architecture, okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, can you elaborate a bit more on the intended uh, PNF support? Will it be generic functionalities that are useful for PNFs or are you targeting some specific PNFs? Or can you give some example here? It's a generic, a generic model for the PNFs. It's not for a specific PNF, okay? And 
we the, the way we plan to to support it is by um, managing the concept of a PDU, physical deployment unit. So normally a PNF would consist of a single PDU. But the advantage of modeling a PDU is that we could have hybrid network functions consisting of virtual deployment units and physical deployment units. And we could also have pools of PDUs that could be used, for instance, to, um, let's say, create or deploy PNFs or hybrid network functions using, for instance, a PDU from a specific pool. Okay, so the, the concept of PDU allows us to much, much more flexibility in that respect. Okay, thanks. Any other question? Javier, you, your turn to close. <laughs>